Good evening, everyone. And on behalf of the American Center in Moscow, I'd like to thank you all for joining us on this wonderful first summer evening. Uh, and my name is Emira Tulhanova, and I'm a literary enthusiast from Moscow, Russia, who studied literature in Lincoln, Nebraska. And today, it's a great honor for me to host the reading by a fellow Nebraskan, a wonderful poet, Mary Hickman. Uh, Mary Hickman is an author of two poetry collections. This is The Homeland and Rayfish, which won the which won the James Laughlin Award from the Academy of American Poets. She is an assistant professor of English at Nebraska Wesleyan University, teaches for the University of Iowa's International Writing Program in summer, and is a member of the mighty Vitamin Big Band. Uh, the way it's going to be uh, for us tonight is uh, our amazing poet is going to read her poems for about 30, 40 minutes, and then we will open up the floor for questions. You can drop them in the chat, and I'll be happy to follow them to Mary. Also, our team at AMC has dropped into the social media a link to the poems Mary will be reading and accompanied by the side-by-side -side Russian translations, so you can read along if you choose. And uh, Mary, welcome to Read a Poet. Thank you, Vamira, um, and um, thank you to the American Center for having me. Uh, it's really exciting to be reading um, to people from all over the world at this moment. I sent the link to my mom, so we'll see if my mom has joined. <laughs> uh, so she's in the mountains of Idaho, a state in the west of the United States, which is, um, you know, maybe a 20 hour, 22 hour drive from Lincoln. I was very excited to hear that Samira had lived in Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, it's a great and wonderful poetic coincidence between the two of us. Um, I wanted to start by thanking my uh, translator for the poems. And uh, I know that the audience has a link to the poems um, translated into Russian. And so um, Anna um, uh, was very, very gracious in the translations. I gave her a lot of words and <laughs> many difficult words. And in fact, she caught a really great typo in one of the poems for me. So thank you to Anna Kushelnitskaya um, for the beautiful translations. Um, I'm gonna just dive straight in, but we'll have time for questions afterwards. So anything that comes up, put it in the chat for later for questions. Uh, one of the things to think about before I, or to talk about before I read is that the first poem is a prose poem. Um, and it is thinking very specifically about the artist um, Haim Soutin, uh, who is a Belarusian Jewish artist living um, between 18, maybe 63 and 1943, somewhere around those dates, uh, and part of the um, Expressionist movement in France. He moved to France to paint. So this is thinking about some of his uh, big canvases that always wow me. Still life with Rayfish. Soutine attempts to keep the color of his first carcasses fresh with buckets of blood. The neighbors hate the stench and the flies but he continues to pour blood over the bodies until he is ordered by the police to stop. Only then does he use formaldehyde. He isn't preserving the flesh, just refreshing it, maintaining the life color of the carcass and painting that blood as lush. He is not emulating and there is no reminiscence. When Soutine's last privately owned carcass painting, Le Boeuf et Crochet, was auctioned recently, the seller expected to get something like seven to $8 million. In the catalog description, Christie's lingers over Soutine's early intense poverty and the sudden relief of that poverty when he sold a large number of paintings to a banker. Le Boeuf Ecorche represents a point at which Soutine could afford to buy whole beef sides just to look at rather than eat. Le Boeuf sold for $14 million, which I find depressing, or it misses the point. If anyone blends the line between still life and portrait, it's Soutine. The still life reflects portraiture without any deliberate reminiscence. Soutine's brothers beat him mercilessly. Their cruelty became a ritual. One day when Soutine was 16, he was approached, he approached a pious Jew to ask him to pose for a portrait. The next day, this man's son and his friends beat Soutine. It was a week before he walked again. Why is this story retold so often? I don't think I create heroes in my portraits in the conventional romantic or poetic sense. Soutine fights against the monsters. He fights against neuroticism and fear. His portrait can be made in many ways, but always the same image. Sometimes, in fact, I make the same portrait. Say, still life with Rayfish. It could have been a fairy tale. 
My way of making a fable from the portrait is my way of telling it. I simply told it as I did. But our hero is really there, the one in the portrait who possesses the feel of his own life. This is part of Soutine's process also, to see the forbidden thing and paint it, to severely constrict his subject within the frame and enclosed space. He imprisons the image within the image. In Chardin's ray fish, the ray at rest has become a ghost already, nearly translucent at the mouth and eyes. In Still Life with Rayfish, Soutine attempts a portrait of Chardin. This ray rises howling from the table, its membranous belly shuddering, its entrails glow with warmth. Today you will eat dead things and make them into something living. But when you will be in light, what will you do then? For then you become two instead of one. And when you become two, what will you do then? Do I mean that in all our portraits we tell the same story? But I can't say I have a special direction, although I feel a certain evolution in myself in the ways I find of saying things. Let's call this a transition from attention to grace. When Soutine works in serial, painting the same object again and again, the paintings convulse. Seen side by side, their convulsions evoke sensation. I see great possibilities by shifting the wings, moving the feathers or necks. Swirling, lacerated flesh swells against a red or green background. The figure of the bird, whirling foul of penitence, beats even as darker backdrops threaten to swallow it. The body which depends upon a body is unfortunate, and the soul which depends upon these two is unfortunate. In this portrait of the rayfish, the ray is pulled up by its wings, each wing pierced with wire hung from the stone wall behind. Or the next ray hovers over the table ascending. The next ray swoops midair. Soutine presents the butchered animal open, taken to pieces, bloody, glistening, shimmering, yet conspicuously dead. I devour a skin that is grotesque with demonic aura, the terror and humor of its textures. I paint the skin made from the sheer white curtains blowing at windows in stark sun. I make a figure from gray feathers stuck to my neck with sweat. I build whole visions of life out of the swirling black velvet of a woman's dress as she wades in water. That wet velvet billows, a second skin, sensual, dragging her under, pulling her out to sea. In La Dolce Vita, the soft, dark flesh of the monstrous ray is bound tightly by the fisherman's net as the ray is hauled onto the beach. You will make a million with this fish. It's alive. It's been dead three days. Rolled onto its back, its mouth pulls open, and one black eye stares back. Its slick surface resembles the protoplasmic source of all things. It insists on looking. The guardian angel of Adrian Lyons Jacob's Ladder quotes Meister Eckhart to the dying hero. Eckhart saw hell too. He said, the only thing that burns in hell is the part of you that won't let go of your life, your memories, your attachments. <laughs> they burn them all away. But they're not punishing you, he said. They're freeing your soul. If you've made your peace, then the devils are really angels freeing you from the earth. I imagine the nets around the rayfish as sutures pulled from its flesh, releasing the wings to unfold. I picture the scarred eyes of the surgeon's attendant in Jacob's ladder as two layers of flesh folded over, bones and lumps of flesh piled in the hallway, faces both vacant and badly twisted, lines body horror technique. The face moves with an alien speed, a filmic sensation of seizure, fit, possession, mutation. He who has known the world has fallen into the body, and he that has fallen into the body, the world is not worthy of him. The ray's blank eye and the attending angel's carved sockets equally terrify. Suzanne, Soutine's eddies in oil capture the ray's flesh. He structures my seeing. He imparts vision. I pamper this slight ghost. I encourage it. It takes shape slowly. It takes possession. Once I saw the village butcher slice the neck of a bird and drain the blood out. I wanted to cry out, but his joyful expression caught the sound in my throat. Soutine pats his throat and continues. 
This cry, I always feel it there. When as a child, I drew a crude portrait of my professor, I tried to rid myself of this cry, but in vain. When I painted the beef carcass, it was still this cry that I wanted to liberate. I have still not succeeded. The next poem I'll read is one that I wrote about my time in Idaho, where my parents live. Um, I lived there in my 20s, and I did a lot of whitewater kayaking, which now that I'm in my 40s seems like a crazy thing to do. But it was really fun, if dangerous. Um, and so I spent a lot of time up on these beautiful rivers and these gorgeous canyons of Idaho, um, and did have many near-death experiences um, in these different places. Uh, and this is a kind of ode to the river that I wrote. The river. A girl wades into a river at midnight, silver rapids farther on, black over gray. I wade into a river at midnight, the moon high, it is silver and bright. The canyon cliffs lit like winter at midnight. I wade into a river at midnight, she pulls a fish to her chest. She wades into her shoulders. She hugs a flat fish to her chest. I wade into a river at midnight. It is the payette. It is the payette. I climb the cliffs in moonlight up away from the road, a mountain highway. I wade into the river. She climbs the goat trail into the mountain at midnight. Farther up the river, reports of a death. I flew into the river at daybreak. Was it still just the payette? In spring rain, I spun off the road and again into the river at daybreak. Up all night, wading and singing in the river's hot springs, drinking beer at Pine Flats well past midnight. Report of a death, report from downstream. I kayaked the stretch of river at sunset. Chill settling on the red canyon walls. I flipped my boat in this river at sunset. She wades into the river at midnight. Her brother sits on the rocks at the edge, sits on the bright boulders of midnight. I pull my fish to my chest, silver flat fish flapping and beating. They found me by the river at midday, old couple in a white sedan. It was still raining at midday. They drove me to the rangers and waited. She wades into the river at midnight. Only a mile down the river, reports of a death. My car entered the river at midday. At the rangers, I heard reports of more deaths. A minivan entered the river a mile below me. My brother watches the water swirling in circuits of midnight at the spot where later I flipped. I flipped my kayak at sunset. The river is lower in center and boaters are thinner. If she climbs up the mountain behind her, she will follow the trail to a clearing, the edge of a series of hot springs. I wade into the river, I'm trying to tell you. I hold the fish, she flaps harder. Report of a death up the mountain. Report of a stumble on the goat trail. The week my car went into the river, a river I've entered before, that week and a mile below me. Reports of a river much deeper, too deep and the minivan went under. Payette. I wade into the river at midnight. My boat flipped and I couldn't swim out. I crawled up the bank of the river at midday. I held my breath upside down in the river at sunset. I'll ask Will what he knows of the river and my brother who watched me from rocks. As that girl, she wades into the river and carries her fish to the shore. Speaking of poetic coincidences, um, Anna told me when she was translating these poems that she spent uh, time in China and actually worked with a lot of people from Shenzhen. Uh, and so when she was translating the Shenzhen poem um, that I'll read next, it brought back a lot of memories for her. So um, I am excited to, to read this, knowing it was translated with such great care from someone who knows a lot about this region. Uh, and Shenzhen was one of the cities we lived in. It's now quite a megalopolis, but at the time it was smaller and you could still see the parts of the city that had been um, kind of raised uh, by Mao. The uh, parts of the mountains were just completely 
shorn away to make way for the city. And there, it, it's on the shore. Um, you know, Hong Kong is across the water from it. Uh, and the shoreline is um, both beautiful and, and at the time, I'm not sure I haven't been back for a while, horrifying because it was always littered with so much industrial waste um, as Shenzhen was uh, an early spot that was open for um, free market um, enterprise. Shenzhen. And this particular poem deals with um, the work of an artist from Shenzhen named Chu Yun, um, whose work reminded me so much of my time that I lived there. Chu Yun's early portraits of the city, who has stolen our bodies, shows 27 bars of used soap gathered from friends and arrayed atop a white plinth. Each pastel colored bar has been worn down diminished and abandoned after use. Now anti-monuments, they are non-objects that exist only because someone has decided to stop using them. They recall the contours of the absent bodies. The rounded corners reproduce the negative space of arms pocket, hips ridge, hollow of the eye, lips and dent, wrinkles of the face. These stiff figures of memory remain as estranged forms, as refugees. Looking at the reflection of my face in the white shine of the plinth, I think how much tidier to have born, been born old and aged into a child, brought finally to the brink, not of the grave, but of home. I've heard there are beautiful beaches here, maybe as close as an hour away, but I've never seen them. The stretches of sand closer in are littered with rubber tubing, syringes, empty pill bottles, I collect it all in a metal box and bury it as treasure. The beach stinks and rots around me. Eroded rocks crumble out in the bay, resembling crusted lace or moth-eaten linen. Covered in birds and completely white with bird shit, these rocks rise near celestial against the soot-filled sky. Shenzhen is not a tourist destination. Neither is it home. Each resident has immigrated from somewhere else. Each body displaced and dispersed among the stiff architecture and pale apartment buildings. The human body in China has never been seen to have its own intrinsic glory. I lived here for years among the currents of mobile labor and outsourced production that defined the Pearl River Delta. I've tried to untangle myself from Shenzhen's way, webs of commerce and daily life, humidity, stench, pollution, traffic, construction, and manic border zones. Yet in Constellation, Chu Yun's rendering of his cramped Shenzhen apartment still alludes to my present body. The physical self has been loosely arranged as used electronics, a water cooler, printer, or TV. What vision of Shenzhen is recalled by so many flashing lights? Go back into yourself and look, Chu Yun would say. If you do not yet see yourself beautiful, then cut away, polish, I walk into a dark room. As my eyes adjust to darkness, I become aware that flashing lights emanate from electrical appliances. They are either in pause or error mode. I ask him, why all this barbarity? He answers that he loves beauty and would have it about him. In my memory of the city, I discover a woman who is beast turning human. Or if you're drawn towards cities with a lather of misery, if you want to find a population that will be locked together in the inn, then you are on the trail toward our port of poor beasts. You are approaching our mildewed harbor, invaded by figures of mangrove and steel scaffolding that have twined their antlers and are found dead that way, their heads fattened with a knowledge of one another they never wanted, having to contemplate each other head on until death. What an autopsy I could make of Shenzhen with everything askew in her bowels a kidney and a shoe cast of Imperial Beijing, a liver and a long spent whisper of Sichuan, a gall and a rack of scolds from Gansu, the lining of her belly flocked with the locks cut off love in Shanghai and her people coming down the grim path of we know not to, we can't guess. To be a body in this city is to rob yourself for everyone. To become incapable of giving yourself warning, it is to be continually turning about to find yourself diminished. I'd like to shoot a clean image and without mentioning aspects such as the place's historic stature, victory spot of the revolution, the red cradle, and so on. 
I'd like the image to show this city as a beautiful place. Instead, the image reveals the way the body escapes from itself through the delta's open mouth, the anus or stomach of the bay, through the circle of the plastic wash basin in each kitchen, the point of an umbrella at each door. In Shenzhen, I have known the soul is figure and form, a frothing of blood around the heart. The soul is a substance. Chu Yun decorates our city with brightly colored flags of announcement. From the top of each gray tower, he hangs lines of pink, red, gold, and blue triangles, crisscrossing the scaffolding, forming a bright grid upon the yellow cranes and the green fruit trees. The flags insist the body should shine with happiness, with banal beauty and feigned promise. The flags insist that there is laughter incorporating into the city and tinged with the smoke and noise of our streets. Chu Yun succeeds in finding the stag beetle to be something hard and fierce and intestinal worms to contain a determined countenance. As our coastal plants, what an expression of love in the lychee trees. 8,000 snapshots of his own tiny apartment glued in thick stacks so that the only, only the top image is seen, his physiognomy of our living bodies, a mesh of markings, organic labyrinth of meanings, Shenzhen offers us her great cosmogenies of thought, human faces, bodies. Outside, small brown lizards cover the courtyard. Children break off the tails to lay them in rows. One of the things that I think about when I do read that poem, having um, a high suicide rate there and a, and a low quality of life, and it is it, the human population and um, the, the degradation of that happens uh, because of commerce in the city, I think is something that we, um, that when you're there and it's so, as, as sort of spiritually miserable, it's really striking. Uh, and I, you know, I, I love Shenzhen and I love the people that live there. Um, and uh, and Chu Yun's work is amazing. So I, I would really recommend checking his work out. Um, there, I'm gonna, I think I might for today hold off on the, um, I've had many near death experiences and come back to it depending on time. Um, it does talk about one particular kayaking experience where I almost died. So it relates to the river poem in that, but, um, I want to move down, uh, and read, um, if the heart does not restart. Uh, in my 20s, I worked in uh, heart surgery. So if you see shows about surgeries and the surgeon sort of holds out his palm and says scalpel and a hand appears and puts the scalpel in his hand, I was the hand that appears. Um, and one of my jobs was to stand there and hold the heart over while the surgeon sewed grafts on the backside um, for, um, for different open heart surgeries. and. So while I would stand there for long periods holding this ice cold heart, because the heart would be buried in ice to keep it from beating while he was working on it, um, I would I would think a lot about the strangeness of having my hand inside the chest of a stranger. Um, and this is a poem I wrote about that time. If the heart does not restart. As I try to wonder about a stroke, an embolism, a rupture, or pancreatic pathologies, sudden invasive virulence. Instead, I think, go to the store for Roundup. Then the French neighbor, gardening in her silk blouse, hints chemicals might take care of the grasses on our side, the ones choking the basil. But I say, bittersweet or Japanese creeper on the fence, what's the difference? I'd go to a restaurant or the beach. I'd gone to the post office. She's saying it again. Sweet autumn clematis should be more vigorous than the large flowered clematis hybrids. And on the internet, I know she fought with every ounce of strength, or she died peacefully at home. An appropriate response to this? Bullshit. It's comforting, but still, she wrote so many books. She is writing so many books. All of these books undulate from her like swells, like the yellow liquid left in the tube after selling platelets, like honey. I'm not saying vampiric when I think of everything going wrong in the blood, or the tubes carrying blood, or blood keeps going where it shouldn't in quantities the brain can't handle. When he took a job counseling terminal patients, when he no longer had clients but patients, then he had the stroke. 
He stroked. Who knows how to respond to this? During surgeries, I watched the blood spinning through tubes, getting aerated, oxygenated, whipped up, and sent back to the limbs. I wish there was less hard blue plastic, less crisscrossing of tubes and wires. My nightmares in recent years involve violating the sterile field. I touch my neck, then I touch the edge of the wound, and I'm filled with shame, but also fear, because maybe now there's nothing to be done since I've contaminated the chest cavity and the patient will most likely move on to infection, fever, death. But I won't know because one, I'll wake up, or two, wakes up, will stop mattering. Option three involves me trying to cry in the locker room, bathroom, but instead wanting a sandwich, not knowing the patient's name anyway. I'm on the hunt here, following the vine to its roots, only to find it's one vine among 12 and would better get the shovel or decide this is probably just wisteria that hasn't bloomed yet. In a nightmare, I once vomited on a patient. I just missed the chest cavity. Awake, I really did drop many valuable things. One of the things given to me to hold was the heart itself. I never held a warm heart, but sometimes wish I had. I think I would have cried more for a warm heart that refused to restart. The cold ones nesting in sterile ice never inspired hope of life. The real difference between a surgery that ends well and one that doesn't is the way the body is closed. If the surgery is successful, then the patient's heart restarts and the pressure comes up. A regular rhythm is achieved and we close each layer, heart, sternum, any little blood vessels, fat, each layer of dermis. If the heart does not restart, there is no careful sewing. We each take a staple gun and roughly close the skin, but not the layers underneath. The sternum is still pl pulled closed with wires, but fewer and less neatly tied. I grab the incision's edges, tug them together with one hand, and with the other, start the grating plastic click, click, click of the gun. The table is pulled away and the drapes peeled off the skin. We wipe away the blood and the betadine. We pull the blanket to the chin. I never stick around to see what happens next. Or I do, and now I don't know. <clears throat> a change up of pace. I wrote this poem on my 40th birthday. I try to write a birthday poem every year. Um, and this is the one from that day. And it's titled with two of my favorite things. I will show you a third favorite thing um, in the form of the mug I'm drinking out of. This is my cat. <laughs> I had him put on a mug, a uh, spicy cat. So that would be a third favorite thing, but um, coffee and birds. I like to drink coffee and sit in sun and watch birds. I've liked this for 40 years now. Even as a baby, I said, make it black, ma. Black like a lonely night. When I read poems, I'm thinking of coffee and birds. Why be anything but scraped in sun? I pick a bitter slug off my chest, throw it against the sidewalk. Why be anything but run through with sun? I once offered my wrist as a measure. The birds watched it turn clear in the white heat. This is the part of the poem in my poetry badge. Give me, give me that knife and I'll carve a better poem from wind, whistling through sun, from wind, whooshing back out of a blackbird's hollowest bone. Um, this next poem, which I think, I think I will make, um, my last poem, so we have lots of time for questions, uh, is a poem based on the Disney cartoon, The Little Maid. So, um, if you've seen this and have any childhood associations with, uh, The Little Mermaid, um, the Disney film, uh, you know, put it in the chat. Um, I'm, I would be very interested to hear. For me, I watched this as a kid and, um, was very taken with the witch character and also with some of the things that Ariel goes through um, and where she's left at the end. And thinking also about the difference between the Disney movie and the original um, fairy tale that it's taken from. And Disney, of course, goes for the happy ending. But, um, you know, I think any of us that have ever related to Ariel understand that perhaps that is not what happens at the end of love. Ariel, <clears throat> what is the fat witch called? Spilling out, spilling, spilling out Ursula. What is the name of the little crab? He's singing, he's dancing. Is he wise? 
Sebastian. What pearl rolls quarrel over smoke, pours music down the volcano, spin steel drum, rust in a sea, growing rings on loops over threads like red purple spires hung with shark jawed shelves until it all thuds with bass. It's okay, I remembered his name. I sit on the seafloor and cry. It's all salt water crying and not crying, the same wet purple. Ursula blacking worlds, spilling, spilling her ink. What is a performance and what is love? What is the moment Ariel thinks she is love and knows she's been had? Steel drum, ringing in lost steel drum, wrapping sound waves in waves of wet, her throat a burnt coal, her marshmallow throat toasted on a spit it is not going to be okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mary. Oh, it was beautiful. And especially love the little kind of like stories behind every poem. Thank you so much again. And I want to remind our audience that you guys, you are free to um, send your questions and um, I'm going to pose them to Mary. Mary, first, I'm going, I actually had this one of the questions, um, like, as I was reading your poems, I was thinking that you have this special kind of, like, um, not the focus, but, like, you have the special kind of feelings for the body, for everything, like, you know, bodily, like, you have very detailed descriptions of uh, and organs and everything, and I was wondering where that is coming from, but you mentioned that you worked uh, in a surgery uh, room, right, in a breeding room. How did that happen? And because now now you're a, like a, a poet and an assistant professor, but how these two experiences uh, came into your life? Yeah, I think um, you know when I was young, I I thought that um, I would want to be in medicine and so while i was in college i was also trying to get hands-on experience for my medical school applications so i was doing this job of assisting surgery i was also taking lots of, of classes like uh, medical terminology and anatomy and physiology and pathophysiology and um all of these kinds of classes that were learning the language of the body in all of these really nitty gritty and interesting ways. And um, as I was working in heart surgery, I just kept writing more and more and more to the point where my focus was so shifted to the writing of the body um, that I realized that was what I was called to rather than the actual holding of the hearts, maybe more the metaphorical holding of the hearts. And so um, I, I kind of changed my focus and decided to go to graduate school for poetry and went to the Iowa Writers Workshop um, for poetry. And uh, yeah, I still think a lot about the body. And actually, you know, now that I'm in my 40s, I think about the aging body in a different way than um, I did when I was working in heart surgery in my 20s and writing about it. Then I was seeing a lot of death. Um, but I wasn't thinking but it seemed far away because most of the patients who didn't do well were very, very old and, and very elderly and sickly already. So there was some already kind of frustration I had with the body's um, mutability, right? It's, you know, the, it's impermanence. Uh, and, and I think now I'm, I'm, I'm very much interested in this kind of strange divergence that happens where as you, age your body feels like it's getting worn down <laughs> um and then and you'll you'll experience this in the future um and and at the same time you're like you're i don't know and this is the kind of mind body duality that i was trying to think about a bit in shinbold of the western world um there's a kind of tempering of the spirit that's happening in interesting ways too. So that's something I'm really interested in thinking about and writing about now. So the body just won't ever leave the work. And as you can tell from the artists that I write about, uh, I'm very attracted that are actively engaging with these themes and ideas as well. And thank that's you for true. that question. Yeah. And I can see a lot of paintings behind you. And also um, I noticed that there is like fascination with, with artists and uh, uh, you mentioned that you've lived in China for a while. 
but how did um like I'll, I'll ask this way if there were people like studying you um, in the future what experiences from your life would be crucial to understanding uh, your poetry oh yeah that's a I love that as a question um I think I think my hope is that the poems live on without me and no one ever needs to know anything about me they could find like what you know with Sappho where her poem is pulled from the dump <laughs> and uh and it's still like as throbbingly alive today for us with all the heartbreak and longing and everything um as it was three thousand years ago I think I hope more for that to happen um that that they can live on without anyone needing to know anything at all um because they're addressing things that are so hopefully universally human um and things that will continue to matter and yeah I guess that's what I'm, I'm hoping the most is that I'm making work that can last beyond me Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I can see a question from the audience, but I'm going to just like follow up on this question. Uh, in your poems, you mentioned when I read poems, I think of coffee and birds. Uh, what would you like people to think about when they read your poems? I think coffee and birds would be perfect, actually. That's, <laughs> um, those are some of the best things in life, especially if, if you're a coffee drinker. <laughs> it is. Uh, or tea. Um, yeah, uh, I think that there's there's a lot of the poems that I've written that are um, dealing with really tough topics, uh, you know, like pretty depressing in some ways, or at least poignant, hopefully, in, in kind of um, ways that I think that the ability to have lightheartedness there too um, is really important. I've been trying to put jokes in my poems lately um like literal literal actual jokes a new poem i'm working on is it's a long poem so i didn't inflict it on the translator or or you all it's already 13 pages long but it talks about really intense topics and so i just actually went and looked up jokes that my favorite writers their favorite jokes and i put in kurt vonnegut's favorite joke and I found other people's favorite jokes. And I, and I, in the poem, I say, now I will tell you Kurt Vonnegut's favorite joke as these kinds of moments of pressure relief. Um, yeah, so hopefully there's a, a way to be thinking of coffee and birds um, within <laughs> even the more difficult poem. Thank you. Uh, there is a question from the audience. Uh, thank you for sharing your poems with us, Mary. Do you think the poem should be read aloud or experienced silently on the page? This is such an excellent question for where I'm at in my life right now. Um, I am doing, I might, I might even throw a link in the chat in case anyone is interested later, but I am doing a lot of work with the band, The Mighty Vitamins, which was in my bio. And um, the poem, The River that I read, uh, that poem has never been seen by people on the page and tell you all for this um, because it's a performance piece mostly um, and I think it's really interesting that way uh, where I perform it with this band and it's, it's this kind of very oral experience um, and I can try to put a link somewhere to some of that and so one of the things that's happened in the last maybe five years when I've started performing the poems with this band um, is that I change the poems as I'm reading them. I didn't today since I didn't have the kind of improv of the band with me. And because, you know, they're translated on the page and you're reading along in Russian. But um, that's one of, that is one of the things that I've been loving is the poems have multiple lives. So they have a life on the page and that gets pretty steady when it's published as a book. You can publish it in magazines and things like that, and it can be in one form or another. And then in a book, it gets fairly stable. So the versions of the prose poems that are that are translated here today um, are the stable versions that are in my second book. Um, but the other poems that, that aren't like Coffee and Birds and um, the Ariel poem, those are not published yet. Um, I haven't even sent them out for magazines or anything. Uh, because they're having all of these multiple lives in performance. Um, 
Samir, I don't know if you went to the the music festival Lincoln Calling when you were here, but there's this big citywide music festival, <laughs> really fun. And my band often performs for that every year. And so um, oh my gosh. last year, you know, I did a whole series of these poems and they they the performance of them was this mixing and intertwining and repetition. And it becomes a completely different work and experience in the performance. And uh I've been loving that, <clears throat> that they can have multiple lives. So I think like the poem should be <clears throat> experienced in as many forms as the poem can proliferate into. Um, what I do look for when the poem is going to be published on the page and, um, you know, the reader will be there without me there to <laughs> perform it for them is that uh, it has a formal cues that was, a kind of waltz reading because when we read even when we're reading silently we're still moving our mouth muscles experience, right like so a full body experience even if one is sitting alone reading it on the page um so yeah a uh, great question because i'm thinking about this one all the time thank you so much for, for sharing this answer with us and thank you for you know let, since you mentioned that you've put it on paper for us, thank you so much for the opportunity to read and to listen to that to those poems. Um, yeah, you're all the first eyes, the first eyes. <laughs> uh, and I have this question since, like you know, you mentioned, um, you know, Ariel and and uh, their questions of voice when it comes to authors very often kind of pops out. When was the moment when you realized you have your own uh, voice in poetry or in writing, or is it still kind of like a, a flexible, like you know, thing for you? Yeah, I never totally understand the idea of voice. I do know that I think about it like a radio station. Like if you're tuning your radio dial, which of course now we all just do Spotify and things like this, but <laughs> imagine you have a radio. If you're tuning your radio dial and you hit a song by Bob Dylan, you know it's Bob Dylan, even if you've never heard the song before or like, Jim Morrison or you know some of these really iconic voices and 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 I think about that with poetry like if I am tuning and I hit a Sappho poem I'll know it's Sappho even if I don't know that for sure because it's so there in her kind of fullest expression and so yeah I think with with that um have I arrived at a place where I feel like tuning the radio someone would know <laughs> um would hit it and know i don't know i think i'm still as a writer in the process of continual reinvention my first book was these very like sonic short tiny poems and my second book is these long you know i read you some of those my third book is this whole project where it has these multiple lives on the page and off and so yeah i don't know i'm not sure that i am have reached sappho status or bob dylan status and um, and I think instead I'm, I'm kind of in this mode of exploration. Yeah. And I, I hear this like Sappho's name uh, several times as you, as you answer. What does uh, these uh, poet mean to you? And I think like what yeah. word does it come from? Yeah, Sappho um, means, I think this kind of uh, moment for me when I was in my early 20s, maybe late teens, when I picked up a book, um, I think it was translated by Guy Davenport of ancient Greek lyric poets. And I read her poems and my mind was blown because I thought she was writing like my heart. That sounds cheesy to say it that way. But I felt that way, like I was embroiled in all this, like, you know, dr you know, youthful drama, love affairs and this sort of thing. And um, I didn't know how to write about that at that time without it sounding cliche and terrible and being like, you know, um, you know, the, the detritus of youth in some ways. Um, and Sappho did know how to write about it. And I was so relieved that there was someone who knew what it felt like. And it was, yeah, so it was pretty amazing. And then the fact that she knew it 3,000 years ago, <laughs> but it feels as fresh today, um, was also a late, a, like elating to me, very exciting. And my ambitions for poetry changed 
they grew huge. Whereas before I was like writing little poems in my journal and not showing them to anyone. Suddenly I have this woman who 3000 years ago expressed her, you know, deepest (laughs) experiences to the world and the world took her seriously. Um, And I, yeah, so I think maybe feminist icon slash um, poetic soulmate. Maybe. That's, that's a beautiful that. story. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Uh, question two: Who um, and speaking of like you know, since it came to Sappho, who are your favorite writers and poets? It's coming oh, from the audience. Okay. So we will say Sappho. Let's just yes, yeah, we'll put her at the top. Um, I have recently been translating uh, another ancient Greek female lyric poet. Um, her her name is spelled in English. Uh, A-N-Y-T-E, and she's brilliant. She um, is maybe the earliest example we have of um, the pastoral tradition, um, where instead of writing about wars and heroes and um, the great men, uh, she's writing about nature, and she's writing about um, animals. And she's writing about them, young women, as if they are as important as the heroes and the gods and the great men. And so her work is, there's, we only have about 27 poems of hers, um, but they're amazing. So I would put her as really uh, in my kind of top poets I will love forever. Um, I'm married to a brilliant poet, and I would say he's <laughs> one of my favorite poets, uh, Robert Fernandez. He has... Um, uh, four books out there, so you could find those. Uh, to be married to someone whose poetry constantly challenges and inspires you is very, um, I don't know, it's like the bread of life. <laughs> so I think, you know, he's very handsome, but I think I also married him for his poem. Um, and then uh, maybe in between there, I would put um, a writer like Frank O'Hara where he deals with the daily and the mundane as well and makes it really eternal in in these beautiful ways. And and from that same time period, which would be the the mid um, 20th century in New York would be where he would be based. Um, One of his friends, James Schuyler, would be another of my favorite poets who does the same thing where he's very like thinking about the mundane, the daily, our relationships, our you know, sitting in the garden, drinking coffee and watching the birds, and it becomes really um, universal and eternal. So I would, I think that's a probably a pretty good list. Yeah. Thank you so much. I, I took notes of some of the poets. I mean, that's okay. helpful actually. <laughs> Check them later. Yeah. Um, you mentioned in your bio that you are teaching at the uh, Iowa um, International Writers Workshop and uh, in Wesleyan University in Nebraska. How different is it uh, to teach uh, international writers and the native ones like the native speakers oh samira that's such a great question too because you know what it's like to be around (laughs) nebraskans right (laughs) and you know it's a wonderful culture but it's quite homogenous um right it's you know majority um majority white i would say and majority um christian and um And people who've lived in Nebraska for generations and generations, often growing up on farms and coming into the city for school. And so it's been really interesting to think about their writing in terms of the writers of Nebraska that I love, like Willa Cather. And, you know, and to to help them find, because they feel insecure, like, oh, we've never gone anywhere. We're not fancy. We just live here in Nebraska. No one's ever even heard of Nebraska, you know, to help them find their way into their material, um, I think is really the task with a lot of of the, the self-consciousness that happens from like, I'm a small town. I'm not from anywhere fancy. And of course, that's not just a problem with Nebraskans. That happens all over the world, the rural versus the urban, you know, the kind of um that that's a sort of of, uh self-consciousness that can happen for a writer um and then with the um students that i teach in the international writing program um they're a little younger so the college students are like 19 to 22 and then the international writing program they're more like 16 to 19 and that's actually quite a different moment in life 
um, <laughs> that, you know, it's right before you have to go off on your own and make your way in the world. So you're still in this moment of childhood. And I think that that's been really um, an interesting and beautiful moment to teach because there's all this enthusiasm and excitement and willingness to just explore. Um, and those classes, we have students from 22 different countries who are meeting each other and falling in love with each other's writing and talking about it with one another. And um, for, for those, I feel like as a teacher, my task is to continue to help them um, explore, like go forward and to connect with each other. So the sort of go forward, connect, go forward, connect. And, um, and so that's really great too. So I think that that one is a moment where they get to show each other their literary traditions. And the question you asked me about what writers do I love, I ask them that and they present them to each other. And, um, you know, they, they get to fall in love with each other's favorite writers from across 22 different countries as well. And I think that that's pretty exciting. For my Nebraska students, I make sure I have a very global canon and that we're reading writers from all over. I have many favorite Russian authors that we read, um, Anna Akhmatova and Mayakovsky. And I mean, there's a lot that we read that I just love from, from Russian literature um, and all over. And the Nebraskan writers, they don't know how to find that and they don't really have access to that. The international writers, it's more of a like show and tell, like these are my favorite ones from my tradition. And then they, they continue all around and it's so fun. So it's um, different and, and rewarding, both rewarding, but different. Uh, good question about that. Cause yeah, it is, it's very different experiences. That's so wonderful. It's like, I can, I mean, I'm, I'm jealous of the students. I want to be in those classrooms in both in Nebraska one and the international one. <laughs> there is another there question. You are, from... to, you are welcome to zoom into either anytime. I, yeah. I'm so going to take up on this opportunity. <laughs> yeah. There is a question from the audience. Oh, that's actually a very interesting one. Where do you get your inspiration to write your poems? And um, do the seasons of the year or nature in general influence your writing? Oh, yeah. Okay. So that's, that is such a good question because I'm always wanting to find inspiration. And I love the Rainer Maria Rilke poems, the Duino elegies. And I got to go to the castle in Duino. I didn't get to go inside, but I got to go to the grounds around it where he would walk the cliffs um, when he lived there. And he was, you know, this is where the Duino elegies came to him as if they were being dictated to him from the angels. And, you know, and so he and he writes about that. And so I did go there and walk those cliffs and sort of like wait <laughs> for my own <laughs> things to come to me. Um, you know, nothing did. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't, it didn't feel like how I hoped it would. Um, but then actually later I wrote a poem, a series of poems that was in conversation with his poems from that time when I was there trying to do it. So it's sort of this kind of putting yourself places that feel awkward or strange and letting yourself be really present. And maybe at the moment the language starts up and starts playing and is there, but maybe not, but maybe later, later it does, right? And that might be a sort of Wordsworthian romantic principle of, of strong emotion recollected in tranquility. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think for me, it kind of can work both ways. The other thing that I love is if you've ever seen the painter Jean-Michel Basquiat at work, there's videos of him. Um, his studio is like newspapers, books, uh, he's got the television on, he's got the radio playing, he's got a record playing. I think he would play uh, Ravel really loud on his bolero, really loud on the um, the record player. And he just has all of this stuff all over kind of coming into the work, like all of these voices. And that is actually another way I really like to work is to just have a million things open and there and playing and kind of let it, you know, let all everything come in in that way too. Um, the seasons of the year are nature. Yes, I would say that um, nature comes in a lot for me, especially with the current book I'm working on, which is about um, my time living in the American West. And it's a lot about the rivers, like I read that river poem. It's a lot about the rivers and the mountains and my experiences there. So um, nature has become more and more and more important, I think, um, to my writing. 
Thank you. And there is another question. When you need, uh, you mentioned that you kind of like, you know, the, um, the, the, the husband challenges and inspires you, but when you need advice, uh, where do you go to? And what is the best advice someone has ever given to you about writing poetry? Okay, this is a great question to ask because I have a very specific answer based on the poems that I read. So when I need advice, who do I go to? I go to my husband, Robert, and I go to my friend, Robin Schiff. And she's a, a, an amazing poet also. And um, she, she, the best advice she ever gave to me um, was when she was looking at my Rayfish manuscript, my second book manuscript. And she looked at the poem about Soutine, the first one I read, and she said, put the blood at the beginning, start with the blood. <laughs> and, and that's why it starts with the blood is because it was Robin's brilliant insight. And um, it becomes a, a mantra for me with my poems where I say to myself, start with the blood right like you can you can think of it in different ways with with fiction um where they're saying like begin in the middle of the action but poetry it, i think it's a it works better to think about um you know begin with the blood like really don't don't worry about tiptoeing in to the water um you know go go with the kind of fuerte go with the 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 duende right up front yeah that's such a great advice. Uh, and I, I then have a follow-up uh, question. What would be your advice to the emerging, like, to the writers who just like started on their journey? I would say um, go towards all the things you love and don't worry about if it's not the things other people love. Um, don't try to figure out like what people want figure out where you find life to be its most magnetic for you and push into that, I think would be my advice, yeah. Well, this is such a beautiful, and you see, I'm, I know I'm talking to a poet, and life is magnetic. Beautiful. <laughs> thank you so much. I think, um, thank you, Mary, for the, I think that like we are running out of time at the moment. Um, thank you, Mary, for the opportunity to host it tonight and to the American Center for organizing the event. And uh, to our audience, I want to thank you too. And also remind you to fill out this survey for this event so we can make the events even better. We're very great still. <laughs> and uh, thank you everyone until we meet again. And Zamira, thank you so much. <laughs>